Last weekend, I spent uh, Friday and Saturday with a small group of eight people who make up the senior governance body of our diocese. It's called the Standing Committee. With them, our Bishop Allen and a facilitator, we engaged in a two-day anti-racism workshop. It was a profound, welcome, and difficult experience made especially fruitful by the rich diversity of that group along many lines, including race. The weekend left me very hopeful. Not all anti-racism workshops do that. <laughs> also a little disoriented. But the best part of the program was a TED Talk that we watched by a guy who has, I think, the best name in the world. His honest-to-God name is Jay Smooth. <laughs> when I come back, I want that to be my name. <laughs> the theme of his talk was how the biggest obstacle to anti-racism work and to social transformation isn't hatred, it's perfectionism. The reason is that our perfectionistic tendencies make it almost impossible to imagine that we could be both good people and do things that are a little bit racist some of the time. And yet, of course, it's quite possible that both those things are true. But we have developed, at least many of us in white America, a way of thinking about racism that has to do with a person's inherent character, rather than as something that just kind of happens as a result of some of our actions. We have a hard time hearing, I do, that something I'm doing is a little racist. Because we think it means that we are a racist in a way that is an endemic part of our character that could never be changed. Jay Smooth's idea, which I find very compelling, is that our inability to hold the competing ideas that at the same time we could both be good people and a little racist is keeping us from the individual and social transformation that we so deeply need. And as a Christian, I think this is true not just when it comes to the sin of racism, but when it comes to any kind of sin. When we think about why this is, it's hard not to begin by turning to the theology of New England's first Christian tradition, the Puritans. The Puritans were very clear about the extensive depth of human depravity. They were not confused on this. There were all manner of theological justifications and biblical exegeses that led them to a stance that can easily be summarized by Ken Larson in two words. People stink. <laughs> Ken has a different S word. <laughs> but I'm not allowed to say that from the pulpit. <laughs> and yet, alongside this confidence in humanity's moral depravity, came a belief that some precious few, just a few, were predestined for salvation, for eternal life with God. But the problem is, we couldn't possibly know which of us were the elect. So our task on this earth was to act as if we were among those destined for heaven, even though most Sundays from the pulpit you were reminded that probably you weren't. So when we failed in life, when our sinful behaviors manifested themselves, they were treated not as a sign of human brokenness, not as an opportunity for renewal or redemption, but rather as evidence that a believer was not among the elect and there was nothing to be done for him or her. Poor soul. This kind of all or nothing approach to sinfulness and moral error has yet to be fully rooted out of the consciousness of American Christianity. Perhaps also yet to be rooted out from the extreme American political ideologies, but that's not today's topic. <laughs> The lingering presence of perfectionism can be incredibly destructive. The idea that any moral imperfection or ethical lapse 
or human wrongdoing is somehow evidence of an inherent unworthiness or an indelible moral stain can lead to all manner of harmful individual and societal behavior. On the individual level, the remnants of this theology can lead to incredible shame about all manner of our wrongdoing. And that shame can create bad incentives, incentives to conceal one's own faults or ethical lapses or antisocial tendencies. Incentives to conspire with those we love and care for to conceal their faults rather than to proactively pursue pathways of repair or retraining or therapy or some other kind of social transformation, uh, uh, other kind of transformation. On the social level, the shadow sides of perfectionism lead to all kinds of stigmas and prejudices against anyone who is identified as any kind of wrongdoer. The most glaring of this, to me, seems to be the stripping of voting rights for convicted felons, even after they're released. They don't get to vote. As if their crime was somehow evidence that they can't be trusted to fully participate in society's decision making. And of course, the harm of perfectionism is no smaller when it's directed at ourselves instead of others. For Episcopalians like us and other liturgical Christians, the beginning of Lent is a prime trigger for our perfectionistic tendencies. Discussions of what, what one should give up or perhaps take on for Lent, or even renewed calls for social repentance so often are motivated by latent vestiges of this dualistic theology. You're either perfect or you're damned. At its worst, our Lenten practices, be it giving up alcohol or taking shorter showers or whatever, are meant as tests of our own willpower. It sets up this kind of dichotomy. If we pass, it affirms our righteousness. We are good. If we fail, it encourages a low self-esteem. We didn't make it. Worse still is the practice of taking on disciplines to intentionally cause suffering, perhaps say through a particularly aggressive fasting routine. That again is problematic. It seems to come back to the desire to prove one's inherent goodness by somehow identifying with Christ's physical suffering or one's inherent unworthiness by being unable to match Christ's physical suffering. I am pretty sure that none of these outcomes, testing our own willpower, trying to suffer the way Christ suffered for the sake of suffering, none of that is pleasing to God. Though I'd be lying if I said I hadn't played some version of these games with God before myself in Lent's past. The story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness that we heard just now is often invoked to highlight the necessity of struggling with the devil, the inherent conflict between right and wrong that rages within each one of us and out in the world. And I would hardly deny that that's important. We all have such wrestlings, and rightly so. The mistake is imagining that the consequences of our victory or failure over any individual temptation to evil is as serious as they were for Jesus. When Jesus wrestled with Satan in the wilderness, what was at stake was the redemption of all humanity. Jesus was the second Adam the one human offspring with the divine power to resist the devil's temptations in the way that his great forebearer could not. Jesus was the one who would open for us the very gates of paradise by resisting temptation. His yielding to Satan would have had comic, uh, cosmic consequences. Our yielding to Satan does not have such cosmic consequences, which is good because we yield to Satan frequently, too frequently. Each one of us, as the gospel today also reminds us, is a beloved child of God. 
which means we are beloved sinners, children of God whose preciousness to Christ is not diminished by our imperfections, our incompleteness, or our incompetence. It's not that God particularly likes these parts of our being, but they exist in a dimension of our relationship with God that rests above a core of unconditional acceptance and love that God has for everyone whom God has made. It is so especially important to remember that as we go into Lent, because Lent is not an end in itself. Lent is a preparation for what is coming next. It only makes sense in the context of the thing we're preparing for, namely Easter. Similar to Advent, which makes no sense if you don't already know that Christmas is coming, Lent has no value if you use the time to forget that Easter is on its way. Or, more accurately, that Easter has already happened, right? Jesus has already risen from the dead. We have already been redeemed. Sometimes we get confused. We think that Lent earns us Easter. But that's not true. Jesus has already done the work of rising. And in fact, it's the opposite. Jesus' resurrection is what earns us Lent. It's because of Jesus' rising that we are called to new life as Easter people, confident and sure that the power of God's love will never be broken by anything, least of all by our brokenness. So in Lent, it's the time when we don't have to be afraid of our brokenness. We don't have to be afraid of becoming aware of our fragilities and our sinfulness. Of, we don't have to be afraid of sitting with the fact that we can be both good and broken at the same time. Contrary to the beliefs of the Puritans, we can be beloved and imperfect. And actually, I hate to tell you this, that's always how it's going to be. We're always going to be beloved, and we're always going to be somewhat imperfect. There are many ways that the world makes us aware of our imperfections of the ways that we don't measure up, that we could be better, that we fail ourselves, that we fail each other, and that we fail God. We don't need Lent to create opportunities for that. They're already here. I'm sure you are all aware of the ways in which you don't measure up. The world gives us so many opportunities to see this. The school shooting in Florida this week revealed yet again in so many ways how we're broken, not least among them the failure of our society to care for teenagers who have deeply antisocial tendencies. We just don't know what to do. Maybe we don't care enough, I don't know. But it doesn't take such a public event to make us aware. We're aware. <laughs> the purpose of Lent is to give us encouragement not to get defensive, not to be ashamed when our frailty is put on public view from time to time. Not to deny it, not to explain it away, not to cover over it with easy solutions, but to just sit with it for a bit. Just accept that we're not good at this, that this was a mistake. It's okay, even though it's hard. We know that Easter has already happened. We know that God's love for us and commitment to us is unbreakable. And that should empower us to sit with the discomfort of our frailty more fully, to pray for God's grace to enter into us, and to prepare for the slow, transforming work that the risen Christ is doing in you, in every single one of you. The risen Christ is already at work in you, and I pray that this Lent may be a time when you can become aware of that work, when you can ask to partner with God in that work, and when whatever it is that reveals your brokenness to you doesn't overwhelm you, but invites you in to the powerful transforming work of Christ's presence in you, in us, 
for the sake of the world. Amen.